Well, good evening and welcome to this, the fourth of our Lent lectures here in the parish of Finchampstead and California. My name is Reverend Gemma and I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our speaker for this evening. Tonight, the Reverend Ruth Wells is going to be speaking to us about being excited by the spoken word. She's going to share with us some of her original spoken word poetry and some thoughts and concerns of hers that interlink with that as well as how powerful the spoken word can be. Ruth is the senior chaplain both at Bournemouth University and also at the Arts University in Bournemouth. And I trained with Ruth, so I know that what she's got to say is gonna be both really inspiring, really challenging and really interesting. So without further ado, we're over to Ruth. Poetry is magic. It peels back skin like some expert surgeon, uncovering the very essence of our beings, or like an archaeologist tool, sifts the soil of our soul and speaks into us, profoundly, deeply, uncomfortably, beautifully, mysteriously, poetry is magic. It connects heart and head with golden strands, drawing them together with interwoven complexity so we see things about ourselves we are surprised by or encounter the world differently. Poetry is magic. Let it sink in, absorb by osmosis. Notice what it does to you. Let it whisper into your ears, paint your imagination while simultaneously performing open heart surgery. Poetry is magic. Hi, my name's Ruth. I'm currently the senior chaplain for Bournemouth University and the Arts University Bournemouth. Um, I was at a theological college with Gemma who asked if I would contribute to your Lent series by talking about being excited by the spoken word. It's an absolute privilege and pleasure to do that. I love thinking about and talking about spoken word poetry and just words generally. So I could talk for a long time about this. Um, but because we have some time limits, I'm going to focus in a bit. I'm going to use this time to explore the collision between old words, inherited and well-worn words, and our present reality. I like to use spoken word to reimagine old words because I think in doing that we can rehear things. Poetry can be unsettling and disturbing. It can shake our status quo something I often think Jesus's words managed to do. So I'm going to take a few pieces I've written which are based on old words, read them for you and then pose some questions and thoughts for you to respond to at some point later. I guess one of the beauties of a recorded lecture is the pause button so feel free to listen in again, let the words sink into you, let them do their work. I wanted to start with a piece based on the Magnificat, Mary's song. They are well-known words which we have been handed, but also echo Hannah's song from the Hebrew Bible. The Magnificat is deeply rooted into the rhythm of the daily office in the Church of England and is said and sung daily by Christians around the world. Yet these words have been banned in certain places at certain times because of their unsettling nature. To talk about the rich being sent empty away or the proud thrown down in their conceit isn't the sanitised, demure image of Mary, Mother of God, people necessarily want. Words have power and help to shape how we view the world. These words, which have been seen as too political, too likely to incite civil disobedience, have been censored. I sometimes find the manner in which the Magnificat is recited so departed from its content that the juxtaposition is jarring. I think old words can be desensitised. We no longer hear what they have to say. So using spoken word to speak them again in a way connected to our here and now, I think is hugely powerful. As a little aside, I'm reading from a collection I wrote published by Proust. Um, it's called Formation um, and it is available to buy, which is, sorry, a bit of self-promotion. Anyway, this is my version of the Magnificat. My 
My soul magnifies God and my spirit leaps within me, dances for joy, for God has seen me. Even in my smallness, I am seen, I am noticed, I am known. And I will be known for generations to come as someone blessed by God. She has shown me mercy, mercy that goes on and on beyond the horizon, further than the eye can see, mercy handed down from family to family. God has scattered the proud in their conceit, unseated them from their haughty thrones, thrown them off and set them down. She has levelled the playing field. Those sat at the top of the tree who wield power, tower over will be toppled, brought back to reality, see who really rules. And those who lose, who are looked down upon, trampled on, who trek across savage seas in search of safety, who flee violence at home, whose children are separated from them and numbered on borders by strangers, those who fall victim to political wars, innocents sacrificed on the altar of human greed, weapons funded by governments miles away who care not to see the body count, those who are counted out, who are passed by, looked over, will be lifted up, uplifted, no more sifting sand, gifted stable ground, found, no longer lost. Those who cannot settle the cost, who wonder where the next meal will come from, whose sleep is disturbed by rumbling tummies, will be fed the very best. Those who stand in the food bank queue, who wonder how they feed their children in the school holidays will feast, no longer full of worry, but belly full of warm life-giving food and warm life-giving hope, hope for a future without want. Those who are currently stuffed full of stuff, full to the brim will slim down, sent away empty, for God has redressed the balance and justice is flowing, pouring in the places that have been cracked and dry. This is the God who has called me, chosen me, set me apart, and my heart is full. I wonder how it felt to hear those words reimagined. Were there particular phrases or images which were uncomfortable? I wonder, are there situations in your life or in the life of your community or the life of the world where you would want to see justice flowing and pouring right now? What might justice look like in those situations? Spoken words are a fundamental part of many expressions of liturgy. I came to the Church of England from a mixed church heritage where the use of responsory was pretty limited. I found that aspect of worship really interesting, this invitation to participate. Now, I might want to tease out a bit some questions about participation on whose terms and in whose words, but the principle is one I'm drawn to. I loved and wrestled with the praying together and the responsory nature of the daily office during my time as an ordinand, but there was something which seemed to happen when the community prayed and spoke words together. Words can draw us into relationship, and old words said together for me are like handling treasure one with another. So when I was asked to lead morning prayer for a new group of people at a conference, I wanted to play with these ideas of response and the reimagination of old words. Obviously, I'm going to read this piece on my own, but the phrase, you search me out, O God, and know my heart, is one that is effectively a call and response. So just use your imagination. The original words come from Psalm 139 and are often used as a reminder of being known by God. Again, trying to ground them in my here and now has been an attempt to rehear them in that light. You search me out, O oh God, and know my heart. God, you have searched me out, taken the time to know who I am. The way that I move, those quirks about me that make me me, the very pattern of my fingerprints. Since the beginning, you have marked out my journeys that return me to home. I am known even before a word springs from my mouth, you know it. You can name each earworm tune that circles my mind. And when I find it hard to give voice to what lies deep inside, 
you have already heard those silent cries. You search me out, O God, and know my heart. Enveloping God, there is nowhere in which I have been where you were not present with me. Even when I have had to squint through tear-swollen lids, even in the midst of my lowest ebb, sunk to the bottom of an ocean of grief, or flying high on the wings of success, regardless, your essence present there, sometimes blanket like snuggling me in, sometimes a breath whisper at the back of my neck, sometimes a mere glimpse in the distance, you search me out, O oh God, and know my heart. I am fearfully and wonderfully made, knitted, knotted together, woven, chosen by you, still being formed, forged and fashioned by following you. Overwhelmed by your wisdom as she sits beside me, tells me the stories of what has been and is and is to come, the immeasurable richness of your thoughts and still, you search me out, O oh God, and know my heart. When I'm filled with rage, anger bowling me over in waves of persistent power, when I feel like injustice towers over me and I am met at every point with impossible enemies, insecurity, hypocrisy, inequality, you still hold me and you search me out, O oh God, and know my heart. Here I am. There is no need for pretense. I cannot keep up appearances with you. So I breathe a deep sigh of relief and relinquish the belief that I am in sole control. You search me out, O oh God, and know my heart. Being seen and being known are perhaps both attractive and scary prospects. I love how the psalm touches on both of these aspects. I wonder which words you might choose to express what it is to be known. What is it to feel rage and anger? What does grief feel like? Or what words would you use to celebrate the unique amazingness of you? I like the fingerprint image. It reminds me of being a child and hearing about the uniqueness of each print, much like the beauty of each snowflake. And bodies are a theme in my work. As a feminist theologian, bodies are incredibly important for me to talk about. One of the things I love about poetry is that it makes the connection between heart and head, between the embodied and the cerebral. So I wanted to read a, a piece which plays with the ideas around the body and some very old words about body. This is a piece I wrote just after the birth of my third child, the year I was ordained deacon in the Church of England. The birth was quite traumatic for all of us and I think I found something very deep and healing in writing this and connecting my words with Jesus's. This is my body. This is my body. This is my body broken. I trace the cross on my belly, vertical linear nigra, this black line marking out your expected arrival, then the horizontal one I barely dare to touch, the sunroof as my sister called it, made for your quick escape, your great evacuation made in haste. This is my body broken for you. This is my bloodshed, the messy reality of new life, carnage, the aftermath, blood for weeks, that secret that nobody told me first time round, the wooziness of the initial venture out of bed, tentative steps like learning to walk again, the return of sensation to limbs numb, the shock of it all. This is my blood. And as I flit in between sleep and wake, in the liminal hours, the sounds of your guzzling lulling me into dreamlike trance. I chance again upon the Eucharist, the broken body, the blood shed. And I'm walking the line, placing your broken body into outstretched hands, some eager, others hesitant, all broken. And my brokenness, my bloodshed becomes all the more poignant, the collision of humanity and the divine. And as I hold you to me, our heartbeats echoing, I am caught up in it all, the brokenness and the beauty.
Performing spoken word is a way of embodying text and fleshing it out. For me, it is about physically and visibly making those heart-head connections in front of people. I wonder how you might describe a Eucharistic experience, if that's something you have encountered, and how that has changed in recent times with the global pandemic. Have bodies become more precious during this time? I think I grew up somehow believing that bodies were inherently bad or dirty or superfluous in a sense. And I'm still learning to love my body and being embodied in all the guises of life changes. I'm acutely aware that some of my inherited residual beliefs about bodies come from the stigma of women's fleshiness. A poignant example of that is in the story of the hemorrhaging woman in the Gospel according to Mark. This woman who has tried everything but is still cast out and on the edge of society because of her body desperately reaches out to Jesus. And instead of Jesus' response being of seeking cleansing and decontamination, he acknowledges her faith, speaks directly to her and she finds healing. Leaky bodies are not necessarily the things we want to talk about. And yet this image has been really powerful in my own exploration of divine desperation. I wrote this piece as part of a sermon on the text in Mark. So again, taking old words as a springboard for my own imagination. There is a thin place where heaven and earth intersect in the simple brush of hand against fabric where desperation is met with compassion and divine love pours out of human frame no longer contained but spilling over. Jesus is leaky, porous, gloriously flowing, power emitting, transmitting, healing, wholeness, holiness. My cracked brokenness is desperate too, so I reach out my hands, willing that spilling over to find me in my need, in my desperation, in my vulnerability. There is no space now to be proud, cont to continue this pretense that I have it all together. I cannot keep up appearances. I am incoherent, incompatible, incomprehensibly ruptured. Adhering to the pressure of a shiny veneer is clearly not working. I am tired, worn thin, ground down, my body scarred by the strain of wearing this corset of expectation. My lungs need some space, I long to breathe you in, be met with kindness and warmth and eyes full of knowing, a showing of divine love. So, permeable Jesus, meet me in a thin place, in this space, at the interface of sacred and messy humanness. I wonder whether you have ever encountered a divine desperation. What words might you want to use to describe that? Has there been a time when you have been met with such kindness that words have brought their own healing? What healing words might you want to extend to yourself? Are there healing words which you might like to extend to others? I do think that words can bring healing. I'm not suggesting that that is all that is happening in the gospel story, but that words can be important in restoration. I am on this long journey of trying to extend kindness to myself, of engaging in self-compassion. It feels odd sometimes, but my words have been useful in helping me change my thinking. Instead of holding on to the old words I used to use for myself, I'm trying to choose new words, healing words. This next piece is entitled Takes the Biscuit and explores the themes of bodies and words. I am redacted to the exacting standards of Instagram. Can I ever live up to it? The answer, a short, sharp no, and I know it's all filters and effects and not indulging in quite so many biscuits, but the thing is, I like biscuits and carbs, crisps, chips. 
and I like to think I am a somewhat intelligent human being but I make this confession I have been snapped in a trap with clickbait and I hate to admit it but I have followed that link that made me think a superfood was the key to unlocking eternal skinniness i.e happiness. I am a person who has that too small dress hung forlornly in the wardrobe, nostalgically waiting for that never to come day when I will fit in it again. But then, this body post children has a lot more room in it for happiness. This is a more spacious place for joy to live, for contentment to reside. And I have tried and I will continue to try, but I am the lady who swallowed the lie. Perhaps it will die if I stop feeding it and instead be fed on the fullness of life. And maybe I'll always have to strive to draw my eye away from those picture perfect people to resist the fallacy that all there is to me is this exterior and that if my derriere reaches a certain size I will realise self-fulfilment so those Instagram standards can take a walk for a bit because enjoying being me should surely take the biscuit. Words can be healing, but equally words can be wounding. I'm pretty sure all of us have encountered being hurt by someone's words or even hurting ourselves with our own damaging words over us. One of my struggles with coming to terms of being ordained in the Church of England has to do with how words are used. For someone like me who likes to play with a diverse range of vocabulary, I get quite frustrated that our language about God is often reductive and narrow. The words we choose to use about the divine speak something of underlying beliefs and assumptions, often unconscious. I choose to use different words much of the time. I gave up referring to God in male terms for Lent once and I haven't really looked back. This next piece explores the use of my old words for God, he, him, and my attempts to reimagine them. It is a piece based on a real life encounter at college. Today I ruined someone's morning prayer. I didn't plan to, it just sort of happened. In introduction to our praying, I remember saying, for God herself is love. Those two letters, E, R, uh, cause the offence, U, uh, her, you say. Surely a slip up, a mistake, take it back, he is not her. Just add in the im. Impossible, I think, impossible to know what to do. God is not male but likes to be referred to in those terms lest someone takes offence on his behalf. Impossible to know what to say for every day I am bombarded by him. I wonder what words you might choose to describe or name God. Are there particular words you find uncomfortable? Do words enable you to enter more deeply into prayer? I think words can speak powerfully, not just to us as individuals, but also to us as community. I was asked to speak at a Fresh Expressions conference on the theme of Build a Bigger Table. The image of the table is one which is well known and held within Christian tradition, old words. And yet the table can be restrictive and exclusive. I wanted to write a piece which took the theme of coming to table, but reimagine it and reimagine it beyond the individual to the communal. Build a bigger table, enable those who stand on the edges, who inhabit the margins, live life on the borders or just can't reach, even with arms stretched wide, fingertips spread, the spread laid on in past years. The table set for those in the know who know the code, learnt the correct way to use knives and forks. The silver service of the Sunday service, nervous of anything a la carte, a departure from the status quo, they rigidly hold the guest list with a cyclical circling of names in and and out, in and out, out and in, in and out. Build a bigger table. Cobble it together with corrugated cardboard if you have to. Sit with cross legs on the floor or draw up a cushion or a chair. Share a lap or a seat. Take, eat. This is my body which was given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I 
I like the image of the cobbled together table scene. I guess this past year we've had to reimagine a number of aspects of our faith tradition. I got into a bit of hot water when I took to Twitter with a poetry piece I had written in response to churches being closed. I know they're not closed, but closed to public worship. I found conversations about domestic space being almost inappropriate for worship, deeply troubling, and for me layered with unsaid assumptions about gender. So this piece is a little tongue in cheek, but also explores deeper narratives about whose is public space. Is the domestic, historically the domain of women, unclean and less sacred somehow? God snuck home. No longer bound by the expectations of a consecrated building, she's concentrated her efforts on breaking out. Now in the comfort of a well-worn dining table, she shares some bread with some friends and she laughs and she weeps in the sacred space of home. I wonder what sacred space means to you. What part do our buildings and our homes have in our worship? Alongside the disruption to pu public church worship, the global pandemic has disrupted so much of everyday life. At the beginning of the first lockdown, I felt a real appetite within myself to write new words, to address some of what I was thinking and feeling. The old words I had didn't fit the time. So this is a short snapshot of one of the pieces I wrote, which is about reimagining the lockdown experience for me. Take a pause. A life-giving fresh air pause. A pause from productivity for productivity's sake. Take a pause. From people-pleasing, appeasement, achievement, adrenaline, competitive comparison and perhaps you can begin again liberated, emancipated, fully you. My spoken word helps me to respond to and make sense of what is happening in the world. I like to play with new words and try to find ones that more accurately give voice to my lived experience. I am increasingly using spoken word to help me reimagine divine connection in ways that make more sense to me. To bring life to some of that fleshy, messy reality of being human of using words to almost magically conjure sacred connection and cultivate a deeper spirituality which is mine, not held tightly in the ill-fitting or even wounding words I can no longer hold. This last piece hopes to do some of that. I whisper her name, although I don't know what it is. She is wisdom. She is the life that grows in between the pavement cracks, that flash of green growth in the midst of concrete gradum. She is freedom, the sting of cold air in the lungs as you step out into clear night, or the breathtaking gulp of water after chewing gum mintiness. She is. She is the hum that underpins life, that sits underneath it all, holding it up, pressing it on, the song of songs. She is the first and the last, origin and finale, with seamless infinity and graceful dignity. She is the source, the sustenance, significant other, mother of all. She is the forgotten, forsaken, mistaken, taken for granted, overlooked. I whisper her name and I know she hears, as she hears all those whose whispers are caught in the wind or that stick in their throats or have them choked from them. She whispers back and I capture the sound and ground it into the very depths of me so that I resonate with her hum and she with me. I hope that these words of mine have opened up your heart and your head, have collided and connected with your story, have left you comforted or uncomfortable. Andrew Motion, folk, former poet laureate, wrote, The sacred duty of poets is to be themselves and to enlist the full support of their imaginations, the full range of their gifts for play and association, 
and the whole repertoire of their talent for language to tell us the human truth about humanity, whatever those in authority have to say about it. I hope you've heard a bit of that within what I've shared and that you too have seen a little of the magic that is poetry. Well, thank you, Ruth. That was an amazing lecture and so very different from everything that we've already heard, but equally as inspiring. Really made me excited about the spoken word and to really think about how I use language. Just a few things before we finish for this week. The first is to say that Ruth's book, which she did mention, is called Formation by Ruth Wells and it's available from Proust, that's P-R-O-O-S-T, if you are interested in reading a little bit more of Ruth's work. Ruth is going to join us for a question and answer session at 9pm this evening. That's Tuesday the 16th of March. So if you've got any questions or if you're inspired to talk to Ruth a bit more, do please join us then. Um, and please do consider giving towards the Lent Lecture Programme if you're able. There'll be a link at the end, just as there will be that Zoom information as well. And next week, the Reverend Dr Sarah Brush will be speaking to us about being excited by creation. So do please join us for all of those things. Thank you and good night.